Um, so wearable computing. Uh, now, sort of rifting off what we were talking about, sort of historical stuff. Uh, in 1665, uh, Robert Cook, in, in this uh, what's considered the first science bestseller, wrote this um, publication, basically inspiring the public um, to become interested in microscopy. And he has this this verbiage there, which sounds awful a lot like the beginnings of human augmentation. Basically, he says that in respect to the senses, is a supplying of their affirmative of instruments, adding of artificial organs, and, and as glasses have highly promoted our seeing, many mechanical inventions to improve our other senses, of the hearing, the smelling, the tasting, and such. So perhaps this person invented human augmentation, not, not us. So this is what I'd like to try and talk about as quickly as I can. Some of this stuff I'll have to skip over because I only have about half an hour. Bit of history, who are the players in this area, what are the interesting challenges, and a few examples. Okay. There are two primary principles about, about wearable computing that I've been able to sort of glean from looking at a lot of the literature. And so first of all, what is a wearable computing technology? But we'll basically miniaturize electronic devices that could be worn on, under clothing, uh, on the wearer in some, in some form. The two principles are consistency and multitasking. Consistency basically means that uh, this, this technology is something that doesn't have to be attended to um, to be used. It's always on. It's always monitoring you, and it will do the right thing at the right time. Multitasking sort of riffs off that by saying that, well, essentially, you don't have to stop whatever you're doing to do something to enhance your task. Okay. And so uh, this is sort of the general direction where wearable computing is, is heading. And as early back as you know, 1762, you know, the, the, the wearable computing folks believe that one of the earliest wearable computers is in fact a pocket watch, right? It's a, it's an, it's a miraculous, <laughs> miraculous device that allows you to tell time, right? Compute time. And then in fact, as early as the 1960s, there were patents out for things like head mount display. And it's, it's really surprising that even today we don't have a good pair of glasses, right? Or that that can project computer imagery into our eyes. That that's that would tell you that this is a really difficult problem to solve. Uh, and and MIT was one of the earlier plays in wearable computing. And and of course, yes, being something that graduate students developed, this bunch developed a uh, a, a system to allow you to try and beat the roulette wheel. And so you wear in your shoe a series of buttons, and you use that to to encode with your toes what you think the speed of the roulette wheel is. And as a result, it will do some computation and will signal in your ear through a hearing aid whether, you know, which quadrant of the roulette wheel the ball would ultimately land. 1966, uh, Ivan Sutherland uh, created the first uh, computer-based head-mounted display. Uh, I would say he, he's not only credited as the father of interactive computer graphics, I would say he's, he should be credited as the father of virtual reality. Because in what he created, he created this head mounted display with this giant mechanical system above him that measured the position as well as the orientation of the head mount. And he would update the computer graphics based on the position of your head position. So that way, you can actually move, move around and the object would appear to float correctly from your perspective. That is, for us in, in this lab, the formal definition of what virtual reality is. So he really invented it back in, in 1966. And everything we've been doing since then has just been derived so. <laughs> just better looking. 77. Um, this was the first time, and you know, there's some folks here who are doing the, the haptic vest. This is the first time people actually uh, try to uh, work on sort of tactile uh, inputs. There was a camera that would interface with a tactile vest with a thousand points of resolution. 
uh, and, and it would sort of poke you to give you a sense of what the, what the environment was like. Here's arguably one of the first sort of wearable computer, electronic wearable computer, developed by HP, basically a calculator. And, and you, know, you guys are probably all familiar with the Walkman, right? This was considered revolutionary because it allowed for the transportation of personal music, right? Whereas in the past, it's always you have to listen to the radio, right? Or you have to sit home and listen to your giant you know, your record player. To think back to my history. <laughs> um, 1980 was when people started, uh, you know, thinking a little bit more seriously about how to produce better uh, eyeglasses uh, with uh, displays on them. Here, in particular, for example, was a, uh, was a system that involved a series of LEDs with fiber optics that would vibrate, so they could sort of scan to create an image on the screen so that you could see. The, the computer graphics. And then arguably the, one of the, some of the first people who actually started using this and, and has really shaped the way wearable computing has sort of, sort of uh, proceeded in the future has been people like Steve Mann, who when he was very young, I think when he was still in high school, decided to get an Apple II, stick it in a backpack, connect it to a camera which would transmit the camera signal by these little antenna through radio. And then he took a, uh, I think a camera's, a digital, uh, no, not digital, an analog camera's lensing system, wrapped it around so that he could see the image that was fed, feeding off the camera. So 1981. Of course, most of you probably heard of or read Neuromancer, or tried to read Neuromancer. <laughs> Very difficult book to read, even for computer geeks. Uh, and then 89 um, uh, was when uh, HMD started to really you know, begin to take off. There was a system called Private Eye, which a lot of people who develop wearable technologies tended to glom onto as the device of choice. Because, it, because back then, the concept of wearable, tech, wearable computing was to try and get the laptop or the desktop screen in front of your face without having to wear a giant harness to hold up the display. Okay, and this was some, one of the sort of earliest commercially available practical solutions. And the resolution was incredibly low. It was only monochromatic with red. Right? And this is actually the display unit. This is the headband that you would wear to, 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 to see the imagery. Things, I think, really started taking off in the 90s because this is when the PC revolution started making computers much more affordable, much more accessible. Um, in this particular project, for example, they would attach the, the private eye piece to a computer so that you would sit in class and as the professor was lecturing, you could look up and you can see your display and you would use it to take notes. The idea being, by being able to see the professor speaking and be able to see the screen, you didn't have to sort of take attention away from having to listen to the professor by having to look down to type. At least that was one of the motivations behind early wearable computing technology. Olivetti, they had a very, you know, sort of the earliest idea of uh, identifier tags just like RFID tags are used today, uh, except this was infrared. In fact, this is really just a glorified remote, TV remote. And you know, when you push a button on a TV remote, your TV does different things. So you imagine each person wears a badge with a different button encoding. And inside the entire building, they would just put infrared receivers. And so this thing would just pulse that signal wherever the person was, was happening to be near. And then as a result, you can track where in the building someone was. Very simple technology. <coughs> in fact, so simple you guys can even implement them. Um, 91 uh, was the first time you know, uh, you, we heard of the, this notion of ubiquitous computing. Again, because of the rapid miniaturization of technology, people were thinking, well, someday we're going to have computing everywhere, hidden from us, inside everyday objects that we wouldn't even conceive of putting in technology. For example, the Nike shoe has little LEDs, right? So when you run, it, it blinks and all this kind of goofy stuff, right? Um, that's ubiquitous uh, computing. 
Ted Starner, I'm going to talk about some of his projects uh, in a moment. He's considered the, the person who has worn um, uh, wearable computing for longer than anybody in existence. So he's almost con considered as the father of wearable computing in its, in its modern conception. Um, and so for him, you know, he sort of developed a, a similar system where he had this you know, apparatus with a head mount display, a single piece head mount display, which he used to take notes or give presentations. So when he gives a presentation at, at a lecture, he will typically have this monocle and he will have his slides up there so that he, he knows what to say next because it's built right there and he can still face the audience. The government finally got serious and got interested in this area in, in around 1996 when DARPA sponsored a workshop. And then after that, around 1997 was, was the first international symposium of wearable computers. This is the longest standing conference in this area. <coughs> it's still going today. Uh, in fact, there's a conference coming up uh, pretty soon. 2002, this is where folks started getting more ambitious. There was uh, a researcher, Kevin Warwick, in the UK, uh, in his project Cyborg, and he implanted in himself uh, a device which would pick up nerve signals from his body and it would wirelessly transmit it to his wife, who would wear a little necklace and it would change color based on the nerve signals. And of course, at the, end, at the, at the first semester, the first uh, lecture of the class, Bob Party talked about Ray Kurzweil, right? So you guys know him. And in 2006, he wrote the book uh, Singularity is Near, where he predicts that by 2025, humans and 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 uh, technology will merge as one. Of course, today stuff is going, you know, like gangbusters as far as wearables. You know, you've got things like iPod Nanos that people are turning into watches, right? This little gadget, I think, just came out very recently, the WIM, which is a, a tiny little watch-like module that has essentially a, a Linux box in it, and you can connect this to your cell phone to do the computation, and this would be an update, a display screen, which you can either strap as a watch or make it a little thing you put on your desk. I think this was only like 300 bucks. The Loomis is pretty exciting, but I haven't seen one of these. This could potentially really rev revolutionize um, uh, head mount displays. This is completely see-through. The imagery is projected directly onto, the, lens, uh, onto the, uh, the, the, the optical piece itself. There's no thick optical element, so you're not likely to trip over things because there's some you know, heavy piece of equipment in front of your face. You might still trip over things because you're going to be distracted by the graphics. And that remains to be seen. This is a $100 gadget that you can strap onto your, your uh, you know, sunglasses. And this feed, this, this uh, gets fed with data from, you know, like a, like a, like a solenoid that you attach to your bicycle or for your, um, for your uh, pedometer to tell you that you are running at the correct cadence, for example. Um, this fun little thing, and unfortunately I don't have time to talk about uh, this area called e-textiles. This is where basically people are embedding electronics directly into clothing, and they're completely washable. You can buy some of this stuff now. Headphones directly embedded in the clothing, you know, wash and, and wearable. This one was cute because this was a little beanie that you wear, and it had headphones built into them, and this is your MP3 player, which you would sync uh, with your computer to upload music, and then you would plug this into your beanie. Okay, so, so it really sort of personifies this notion of I'm, I am the robot android, and not only that, it, it glows. So you're walking down the street, and there's pockets on your head, and it's glowing. I mean, that's going to elicit sort of this android future of anything, right? And I think it was 30 bucks, made in China, right? So a lot of the ability to really rapidly produce these products in China is I think what's enabling all these products to suddenly flood the market. Uh, the question is, you know, are they really producing useful things out of it? I don't think anybody, which is why we have this class, is really thinking critically about 
what they're producing. It just sort of, it's all very much market driven. Can I make a profit by selling this particular product? Right? There's no real science to it yet. And then of course, you've got crazy stuff like this, which is I think going the wrong direction <laughs> by Toshiba, which shows something very recently. Uh, it's a giant 360 degree field of view, uh, heads up, <laughs> head down a display that essentially you put over your entire head. <laughs> I had to show it to you because it was just you know, crazy enough. Okay, um, some, of the, some of the challenges, and there are lots of challenges. I think most of the challenges early on in wearable computing has been just trying to get the thing to work, okay? Nowadays, it's more focused towards, you know, now that we have technologies that have good enough battery power, enough computing, how can we do really challenging things like activity recognition. How can the piece of wearable technology figure out what you are doing at that moment in time so that it can inject its augmentation without requiring you to explicitly tell it, I'm now shaking someone's hand or I'm now in shake hand mode. Right. There's, in the 2011 uh, conference proceedings for the wearable computing, there was an entire section just dedicated to activity uh, recognition. And I believe this is obviously something of great interest to Google. Right? You've heard that Google is also thinking of coming out with Google Glasses or Google Goggles. Right? I think a big part of this will be about probably the activity uh, recognition, as well as people recognition. Okay. So I'll try and talk about some of this stuff <coughs> towards the end because I wanted to I want to cover some of the examples first uh, and how this sort of impacts uh, wearable computing. But very quickly, the main players that have sort of you know, created this area are MIT, uh, University of Toronto, and Georgia Tech. So most of the earliest work you'll, you'll see have come from them. Um, as far as sort of the challenges for uh, sensor, sensory interfaces, it's now very easy and cheap to build or to use cameras, gyros, temperature sensors, bloodstream, uh, you know, oxygen monitors, and so forth. Where it really gets challenging, and where I think the, the, the next area that people are really going to pay the most attention to, is the censoring of what's internal to your skin, right? Internal to your body. That's really hard. Um, the other huge area of interest is brain activity. Right now, the only ways of sort of monitoring brain activity is still external. Your brain is, is more than just the top part of it, I mean, the external part. There's all the stuff inside. Right? Uh, NSF, I spoke to a program manager at NSF, he says that we're at this point in brain activity research where we can go one of two ways. We're going to really make the major breakthrough and figure this stuff out, or we're going to declare that it will never happen and give up. If they're at that cost. They're actually funding some projects in this area, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a moment. So some of these devices you've seen, um, this one I'll talk about in a moment. This is a, the e-motive. It's, it's like 200 bucks. You stick this on your head, and it can read your mind. <laughs> no, actually, you know, these are basically EEG sensors. They're horrible because, first of all, you have to be bald to really use it effectively. <laughs> Not really fashionably, you know, trendy, shall we say. Um, uh, and also, the next thing to establish a good contact, you have to wet it with saline solution, so you know, eye drops, right? And so you're you're wearing this apparatus, and you're essentially dripping with liquid <laughs> down your face, right? So it's great for experimentation, but and, but not terribly good for um, for uh, practical use. And in fact, what they basically found is that in order to use these systems effectively, everybody's brain signals are so different, there's so much noise in them, that um, you really have to train the system very hard. And even then, the reliability is still, still very, very low. Uh, but there's, there's hope, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Recon instruments, these are ski goggles. I think you can get these glasses for about 150, 200 bucks. Uh, you basically snap this into your ski goggles, and it gives you a little heads-up display. 
it'll get you your uh, acceleration GPS information as you're skiing down the slope. I don't know how you look at this data while you're skiing, <laughs> skiing and, not, and not kill yourself, but it's a pretty awesome, you know, uh, compared to what Starter had to deal with, you know, back in the 80s. Uh, this unit, um, you can, they're, they're opening up the system so you can actually program it with your own APIs through, through Android. Um, some of you may be familiar with the body media gyro that you uh, attach to your arm, tracks how much activity has been going on, your sleeping pattern. The ZO, that's, it's a headband that you wear. It also attempts to read your brain waves to try and figure out if you're in deep sleep, light sleep, uh, or um, some other mode, I can't remember. And I've actually tried this, but it actually does work, surprisingly. Uh, and this sort of goes back to the early discussion about the model versus the data. In order to program this to figure out when you're in the different modes of sleep, they couldn't figure out how to do it. And so what they did was they went to sleep researchers who collected all this data where they essentially observe on camera people sleeping. And they would say, okay, this person's likely to be in light sleep, deep sleep. And they took all the signals, they averaged it all together, and they, they stuffed it into a box. And it was enough to produce about 70% of reliability. Uh, there's some pretty exciting stuff in what we call electronic tattoos in uh, Urbana, basically. These are sensor-laden circuits like this that you can place on the skin. You don't have to use any adhesive. It's, it attaches literally by Van der, Van der Waals forces, these forces that bring atoms close together when they're, when they're nearby. About a hair thickness. And on them, you can potentially embed antenna, LEDs, solar cells, you know, uh, inductive coils, right? Um, and so this will potentially usher in a whole new means of rich data collection. Now, this is just a research prototype. Most of the time when you see this kind of early technology that's been developed, it will take you about 10 to 20 years, actually, before these are widely adopted commercial products. That's, that's historically been the time scale. So when you, when you hear news about quantum computing discoveries now, it will probably be about it's 20 years before we see the first practical, affordable quantum computer. All right, let's talk about activity recognition. So you've all seen mimes, right? When they do you know, this, kind of, this kind of thing, right, or this. Immediately if I do this, you know what I'm doing. I'm pulling on a rope, right? So the folks in activity who do research in this area basically are saying that humans do so many things that are so characteristic of particular tasks that if we can figure out using gyros or cameras what they're doing, this is the opportunity to intervene right, and inject intelligence and computing. So one example is you know, I have my Google goggles. It's got a camera, and I'm about to meet Joe Schmo, which I've never met before, right? The camera's trained on this person. I reach out with my hand, right, and I shake, shake their hand. This camera's gonna go, oh, he shook his hand, right? Therefore, this must be a new person. This is when I would probably take a picture of his face, save it to my Rolodex, go look up all the information I have on the web, and also download it into my Rolodex, right? Um, so the, the other way of doing it is the classical way, which is you shake each other's hand, you give each other a business card, right? you stuff it in your pocket, and you hope that information will end up in the Rolodex, which it generally today doesn't, unfortunately. Right? And uh, the folks at Georgia Tech has been able to, using this kind of activity monitoring, using gyros, be able to predict with 97 accuracy what exercises you are doing with pair of dumbbells. Like there were six exercises and they were able to uh, accurately predict based on just the gyroscopic movements what kind of exercises you were doing. There's actually an NSF grant um, uh, proposal project that was funded through the wellness that is actually looking into gyroscopic prediction of 
activities, exercise activities. So this is the kind of stuff Starner is working on. You know, remember Starner is the guy who's sort of considered the father of modern wearable computing. So he is really into brain-computer interfaces. He really thinks that this is going to be the future of where things are going to go. There's only so much we can pull from our current external parts. We want to go to the head honcho, which is the source of everything, the brain. And so, um, so one, one of the challenges with, with sort of trying to reading from the brain is that if I you know, say the word apple to someone, right, and you put these EEGs on people's heads, you try and figure out which parts ex get lit up so that the word <coughs> apple makes sense. Well, if I'm a computer geek, the apple might trigger my, oh, it's an apple computer. Right. Uh, whereas for other people, it might be a fruit, and maybe there's something about color and so forth. So fundamentally, it becomes very, very difficult to try and uniquely identify that word apple by looking at brain signals. However, what they discovered was that, well, what if instead you focus on the motor cortex? And for people who knew how to do sign and had to sign the word apple, Remember I talked about activity tracking? And what if there what if we looked at the MRI data for people in the in the motor cortex when they're signing? Perhaps there are characteristic triggerings of, well, let's see, in this uh, in the motor cortex, this part of the brain is, is responsible for jaw activity, lips, face, eyeball, neck, fingers, hand, wrist, and so forth. Maybe there's enough resolution there to allow us to figure out the gesture for Apple. And what they found is that, in fact, they have been able to much easier uh, 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 basically read your mind or the words you're trying to think of by thinking in terms of <coughs> sign language gesturing. So even if you didn't gesture with your hands, the excitation is still there just by the thought of gesturing with your hands. Okay. Now this is powerful ramifications because you imagine people with, and this is one of the application areas they're testing on, with Lou Gehrig's disease, which is basically a, 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 a disease where you essentially lose uh, nerve control of basically your entire body over time. Right? And this is even Hawking, as you know. But imagine if you could provide such a prosthesis for these people, the mere fact that they, they knew sign language, they could think of certain words in terms of their signing, and they can, we can actually pick those out and have them have a you know, voice system to actually speak out those words. Uh, you know, the alternative is to, to do what um, Stephen does, and he, Stephen's still lucky because he still has control over his, his, his lips to go to push down or puff on a keyboard, right? Some people don't even have that ability, that control. So really trying to pull the signals out of your mind to form words. Another project that, that Starner is working on that's somewhat related to some of the things that we're doing here about spider sense is this understanding dolphin language. So he's working on a set of goggles which are waterproof and as you're swimming with the dolphins, he wants to try and communicate with the dolphins in their native language. So the receivers will pick up the audio signals and depending on which dolphin is talking to you, the, the, the goggles will light up in a certain region. So you kind of know, okay, that dolphin's talking to you. Because we can't see the, audio, the sound waves coming at you, right? So what he's doing is taking those, those, those audio samples and trying to discretize it into what are words, what is a grammar, right? And once you have that, he has some underwater keyboard, which he will then use to type words back to the dolphin and you would emit the same set of squeals to the dolphin. The, the current way of doing, I mean, the, 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 the sort of current state of the art in terms of dolphin communication is really you teach a dolphin, these are symbols, and you have them poke their noses at the symbols to say what they want to say, right? Here, he's trying something much harder, which is to actually understand dolphin language and speak back in dolphin. Um, the last project I want to talk about, talk about that's also uh, about the Georgia Tech 
which I thought couldn't possibly work. It sounded so gimmicky. Uh, it was the mobile music touch project. So basically, this is a haptic glove. You know, it vibrates at your fingertips to music. So there's a piano piece that you're trying to learn, right? And it involves pressing these certain keys. So what it does is that as it's playing the music, it will vibrate the fingers that are relevant. And hopefully, you'll be able to sit in front of the keyboard and suddenly magically start playing like Liberace, right? <laughs> well, almost, not quite. Um, so they actually tried this. And to my surprise, it actually does really work. Um, so what they did was basically they, they did exactly what I just said. And then this is assuming that this is for a piece of music which does not require the movement of the hands across the keyboard. This is just for a static hand, of course. And what they found was that through 30 minutes of this tactile exposure, they could take the glove off the person, sit them from the keyboard, and they, you could, they could actually reproduce that piece of music. What they also found was that, in fact, people did it better without listening to the music at the same time as feeling the music. They don't understand why yet. So what that opens up is, well, maybe if they watch the movie, and felt these tactile things, maybe they could learn the music too. They did that experiment, and it worked. So some, the, the subject was watching a movie, movie, audio, everything, and all they were getting were tactile sensations. And about 30 minutes, they, were, they had learned that music. So one of the areas they're, they're applying this technology is to rehabilitation for paraplegics. You know, basically, you know, um, your nerves start to atrophy if you don't use them. And so part of the training to, to for, for rehab for paraplegics is to try and stimulate the nerves, move their feet and so forth, right, constantly. And as a result, over time, you will they will hopefully regain some dexterity. When they applied this to paraplegics, not only did they get the improvement, the paraplegics were really excited by the fact that not only were they getting better, but they were they had sort of acquired this super music learning ability. So it was, it was also sort of amplifying at the same time, beyond what they could naturally do. I mean, we've all tried to play a musical instrument party really poorly, and we know how much grind it takes to try and play something remotely well, right? If there was a way to accelerate that, that would be really awesome. All right. So um, I have about five minutes, and I have to switch to Bob. So I, I, there was a video I was going to show you. So maybe I'll show you that video, and then I'll end and I'll let Bob take over. But this is the uh, the music app that I talked about, which I thought was really kind of fake. But it, it, it surprised me. Oh, wait. Uh, I need... What's the best way of doing the uh, plug in? Yeah, is this it? I think so. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> you may need to use the iPad. Yeah. Yeah. to this and stuff. Uh, John, could you get your answer? So while we're, let's see if I can, if I can cover some of this stuff. No, probably not. Um, before I before I show you the video and I'll, and I'll end, I just want to close with this. Um, the slides, which I didn't have time to go through, and you can look at it later was basically about trends in computing versus power consumption uh, versus battery capacity, because those are the challenges for, for um, human augmented technology. Maybe I can, if, if it takes a little bit of time. This is the growth curve in terms of capability 
for battery technology versus other technologies like uh, <coughs> computing, this capacity, uh, you know, network, a uh, wireless network. And so you know, these things are growing. Moore's law, right? Every 18 months is doubling in capability. Power hasn't been so much, which is a bit disturbing, right? In fact, if you look more closely at the computing speeds, we're still growing roughly at Moore's law. We're starting to get worried that we aren't going to keep going. Um, and so as a result, we put more cores on a single chip. Um, this is the point where hum human simulation 2025 is believed to be possible. You can build a computer with the brain capacity of humans. And then uh, by 2030, they believe there'll be enough computing power to simulate a small village. And by 2050, well, there will be enough computing to simulate all the brains in the United States. And the reason why they can do this is because, remember, these are exponentials, right? And this is the predicted trajectory curve of computing uh, technology. Oh, I just want to test one here. And, and in order for, for this trend to continue, they have to jam more and more of these transistors next to each other. And we're roughly at about here, which is about 20 nanometers. And I think it was Intel that came up with some technology basically to create these sort of 3D uh, uh, transistors. But as we sort of approach um, uh, 2020, we're going to run into potential bottlenecks where we cannot get these transistors any closer, uh, and we have to use things like carbon nanotubes for uh, moving electrons uh, around. So there's some research going on uh, right now in this area. This, by the way, is the, um, uh, the trend for battery technology. This is NICAD. So NICAD, 1970s. <coughs> NICAD capacity really hasn't grown today. Uh, lithium ions, essentially, what, four times the capacity of NICAD. But the, the, the disturbing trend, of course, is that you're seeing lithium ions starting to taper off. So we are in need of a new battery technology to keep up. Now, part of the good news is this. Every 18 months, even though computing doubles, the amount of power that's also needed to drive sort of the, the fixed amount of computing uh, <coughs> actually uh, lowers as well. So we're becoming much more energy efficient, which is very, very good. Right? But the problem is what we've discovered in all of humanity is that the moment you make computing power available, they'll figure a way to use it all up. Right? So that ruins your, your battery problem again, all over again. So, so how human augmented exchange is a game, well, you know, <coughs> we mentioned the cloud, right? We mentioned that the third tenet of human augmented is that the cloud is what will amplify these augmented capabilities, right? And this is important because many of the computations that we would probably want to do, like activity recognition, right? Or like, for example, uh, um, speech recognition on our Siri iPhone devices, right? These are actually very computationally intense problems. And so we would leverage the cloud by sending this data into this big computer in the sky, have it do all the work, and then send the results back down to us, thereby cutting the power requirements to a much more acceptable level. But at the same time, we are potentially improving all these algorithms. Whenever you send all these little gestures to the cloud, everybody is sending the same gestures to the cloud. We can mine for that and find what the average set of gestures are. I mean, every time you talk to your, your iPhone to, to give it a voice command, right? Apple is collecting that data to help it tune its voice recognition system and deal with all the different accents and, and, and so forth. So again, the cloud, we believe, is going to be the main game changer. So uh, I'm just show you this fun video at the end, and then I'll let Bob take over.
All right, today's Big Eye segment, technology to help you learn to play music just by touch. It's TJ and the Pips here today. Uh, researchers at Georgia Tech have developed a glove that connects to your cell phone, your MP3 player, or laptop. As the music plays, the tips of the glove vibrate on your fingers to correspond with the fingers you would use to play that song. Yes. Not just about learning to play music, though. It can also help you be used as a rehabilitation device for people who have lost use of their hands. Technology going to be highlighted at a future media fest at Georgia Tech here in Atlanta next month. And Ed Horner, I have that right? Storm, yes. associate professor at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I have Chad here because Chad has been practicing with this for the past hour or so so we'll put it to the test here in a second but initially just explain what this is uh, to, to to lay people if you will we're trying to understand well if you're like me okay. uh, you would really learn like to learn to play a musical instrument like piano okay. but you really don't have the time to do the practice and it would be great if you could actually rehearse the songs you want to learn without paying attention to them okay. and we've discovered this effect called passive haptic learning uh, where it seems like it's actually possible to do that so we made this glove, we call it the Mobile Music Touch. And what it is is a wireless device that hooks into your cell phone or laptop. Mm -hmm. And so while you're reading email or watching a video or you're doing whatever you normally would do, the, uh, the uh, system plays the song you want to learn. In this case, we're doing Amazing Grace. And as each note is played, uh, vibrators in the uh, fingerless glove vibrate to tap the finger that corresponds to that note on the piano. So what's really amazing about this, in about a half an hour, you'll be able to learn sort of the muscle memory of how to play the Wait song. a minute now. You're telling me all you have to do is put on a couple of gloves, and you play a song for me for a half hour, an hour, and I can go put on a, uh, a concert somewhere. Well, I'm not sure about a concert, okay. but you can like pick it out pretty much easily uh, uh, than you could before. And it seems to work not only just for learning your song, but also for rehearsal. So, you know, if you're a musician and you have problems with repetitive stress injuries, uh, you can actually have the gloves sort of give you that muscle memory, that feeling of the song, and then you concentrate on the expressiveness. Now, is someone using this for that application yet? You'll just develop this. It's not in use. No one's using it just yet. Well, it? we've done it for, we've done four studies on it, so we really know this effect works uh, pretty well. And as you can see, that the, the system's relatively small. You can run it off a, a normal cell phone with a Bluetooth connection. So we're not there yet. We're still in the laboratory. But one of the things that we've really got excited about is not just, you know, learning it for uh, having uh, people learn for playing music, but also for rehabilitation. So let me introduce yes. Major Tanya Marco here. Who's, this is her PhD work, okay. and she's doing some uh, work now on real work. Yes, because a lot of people would love to be able to play uh, instruments, but you're talking about other applications. Yes, sir. Um, what we're looking at is using it as a form of hand rehabilitation. So we're currently working with people who are designated as quadriplegics, which means due to a break in the neck, mm. they've lost the ability to use some ability to use the four limbs. Uh, what we've done is work with a few folks and they've tried the glove. One thing that's really neat about it is they get to play the piano, which is actually a form of rehab in and of itself because you're doing some fine, dexterous movements with the hand. But we had some interesting comments about the vibration that it uh, tended to kind of remind them of where their fingers were because wow. many of these people have lost the ability to sense with their hands. So if they touch an object, they don't get that feedback of actually touching something. So we're trying to improve their ability to uh, perceive with their hands and also their ability to use their hands, those fine motor skills. And then, okay, wow, well, that is amazing, uh, an application there. Uh, I'm certainly amazed as well that you could put a glove on and 30 minutes later <laughs> be able to play the song. Chad has had this glove on for how long now? About 45. About 45 minutes. What was the song? Well, this was what the song would have sounded like. Okay. <laughs> that's, that, 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 that is my musical repertoire. Okay. okay. That's how good I can go. So, he's had the glove on. For 45 minutes, and what was the song, by the way? I, 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 oh, it's it's a okay, it's okay, show the joy. Oh, this ought to be good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ted. Okay. This thing bucks. <laughs> and, and all I did, all I did was I played at my house. Okay. I did my little hurricane stuff. You were doing all the things. I did my hurricane stuff, and it was buzzing on my fingers. You were working. I was sitting there. Oh, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Now, do you have any talent in the background of music? Everybody with the album? And That's you didn't it. know that song, no, correct? No, I, no. I heard it, but I wouldn't would know what fingers to use. And I was thought I had to go back and forth. No, I was hoping for like this Liberace thing. <laughs> <laughs> that like, what, is... What? thing is, if it, you trained on your left hand, you cannot play the song with your right hand at all. 
remember, you ever had this experience before? Probably not because now you have speed dial. You, <laughs> you, you always knew how to dial somebody's phone number, but you couldn't say the number to them 